Okay, I think we're going to get started. I certainly want to leave enough time for law, so, uh, so. All right, tonight, I think we've already mentioned, this is class 9 out of 10. And uh, we're going to hit chapters, I'm going to do chapter 14, and Lowell's going to do chapter 15. Um, if you, you, you may have heard it said that you can be sitting at the feet of one of the world's greatest orators, and I know that's not the case tonight, okay, but you, 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 you can be sitting at the feet of one of these wordsmiths that can create these masterpiece images like Rembrandt here. But the, 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 the problem is that if this orator in painting these pictures doesn't provide for you a, an application of the things you're learning, you've just come away with not much, and he's failed in his, his mission. That is not the issue with Paul tonight. Paul definitely, the, the chapters we're looking at going forward are chapters 12 through 16, those are application chapters on what we've been learning in chapters 1 through 11. So this is time to really apply what we've been learning. Amen. It's pretty important. So it's just, I, I want us to feel a little bit of a challenge with the things that we look at tonight that we're called to be and to change. Tonight we're going to talk about living together in mutual forbearance. That sounds like a, a big phrase. Living together in mutual forbearance. And really if you kind of boil it down, it just really means learn how to put up with each other. That's really what it is. <laughs> It's a little easier for some of us than others, you know, going each way. But God very seriously calls for us to learn how to deal with one another as brothers and sisters. Um, I'm going to begin reading in chapter 14, verse 1, and you can follow along with me. Uh, just listen to this. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on dis, uh, disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man's uh, whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on the one who does not. And the man who does not eat any, everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Uh, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He regards one day as special, does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For, no, for none of us lives for himself alone, and none of us dies for himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So that whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will, will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he has approved. But the man who has doubts and is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and anything that does not come from faith 
is sin. All right, man, that's pretty clear. I mean, Paul is definitely being very specific about how, how we need to deal with each other. I want you to remember that, that the one major theme, the book of Romans, that Paul is trying to get across to the Jews is that the Gentiles were, were always a part of God's plan from the beginning. This wasn't an accident. This didn't turn the wrong way and we had to regroup and create this other plan to put the Jews with the Gentiles. This was a beautiful plan from the beginning. His eternal master plan, this was part of it that he had laid out from the very beginning and this is unfolding before their eyes. If you can imagine how difficult it must have been when you have these paradigm, this paradigm shift and these cultures are being thrust together. The Jews for all these years had, had been raised to understand that we are God's chosen people. And from the beginning, very disciplined, very following in order of what God said. And all the while looking down on the Gentiles who are not God's people, I'm sure a lot of pride and arrogance really brewed up through all of that. But this is a tough time. You can imagine the difficulty that it might be for a Jew who thought he was an only child, so to speak, and then to find out that he's having to come to grips with the fact that he's, he's got this other person who is unschooled, untrained, has lived a sinful life without God all his life, probably never stepped foot in a synagogue, you know, all these things, and now I'm supposed to call this person my spiritual brother or sister? What? That's not what my parents taught me. You see, that's, that's just different. It's hard. And we just gotta, I mean, we don't really relate so well to Jews and Gentiles merging, but I think we can all really relate to the American history that we lived through and our parents and grandparents have. 200 years of African Americans being mistreated, merging cultures together and the difficulties that have existed and still exist today this isn't an easy thing. It's not a simple thing when you put cultures together where people have been taught to do things a certain way and now you're asking them to break those, those traditions, those taught things that they have felt like are right all along and now kind of we're gonna switch this thing all around. So try to imagine it that way that that's what's happening and Paul has got part of the responsibility of trying to merge these together and helping us all understand even today, this isn't a, a weird deal that just happened way back then. He's trying to help us understand how we must be with each other. Not just friendly and nice, but we need to understand each other's weaknesses. And we need to bear with one another's weaknesses. We can't bear with them if we don't understand them. We, don't, we won't understand them if we don't know them. So a big part of our fellowship, the, what we do with each other, we need, to get to, we need to go deeper in our friendships and our relationships with one another to learn more what drives Bob to do certain things, good things, and then some other things, you know. Bob, I have, I'm sorry, man, I have, I have to yeah. um, what, I mean, we, we need to understand each other. And in doing so, we can know how to relate to each other and bear with one another in each other's weaknesses. I went way off script here. All right. Um, Ephesians 2.12, here's a case where Paul is describing, Paul a Jew is describing the Gentiles when he says, remember, and he's speaking to them, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without, without God in, this, in the world. I mean, Paul's calling them, they're foreigners, they're strangers, they don't have hope. That's what that was, was what was thrust upon the Jews who felt like they were so right with God through the Old Testament times. So we can need to really kind of relate and understand that this is not an easy time that Paul's trying to help them with. You really, it, really this is a clash of cultures coming together and trying to form a new culture. And can you imagine how difficult that might be when you're trying to ask people to void what they thought, even if it's from maybe your parents who you respected and loved, you kind of got to learn a new way. And, Learning a new way is never easy a lot of times for a lot of us. Can you imagine the temptations on the Jews' parts to be judgmental, to be con condemning in their, in their connections, to be even aggressively instructional, trying to help the other guys kind of get their act together because we really know how you're supposed to act and you're not acting that way. Can you see all those kind of things happening? Can you see those things maybe even happening in the church here? where we silently, a lot of times what we think, we're not saying out loud, but we're making judgments about each other. 
We might only be sharing it with a few that we know would agree with us. That's not the love that God asks us to have for each other. After all, you know, if you think about it, we are called, we really are our brother's keeper. In one sense, we really are. We have a responsibility to help each other get to heaven. I know I'm not making it without you guys. And I know none of us are going to make it without our brothers and sisters helping us. So we do have that responsibility to help each other get to heaven. And sometimes that calls for correction. But Paul is telling us there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. And he's just really, really strong on that. Um, I want to, to say um, you could see because of this, this culture clash a whole lot of stone throwing going on here. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of stone throwing, mental stone throwing going on. And I'm sure you have made that parallel to today's society and what has happened through our American culture with the clashing of cultures, white and black, the prejudice, the, the mistreatment, the condescending judgmentalness, all the things that have happened and are still happening. And we, we can't be that in this world. We have to be different than that. And I think I would really want to call us each individually to really just look within yourself. Even if you don't express things, do those thoughts go on in your head? Do you think about some of these things? These, the, you're sizing yourself up with others and you're deciding, hmm, well, you know, he doesn't know better. I'm just, you know, he's, he's wrong. You know, those kind of things. We need to help each other the right way and understand and know when to bear with what we should bear with and when to speak about things we should be speaking about. I want to start, it, you notice that Paul starts the chapter, and I know Paul didn't put chapter marks in here. He didn't start the chapter that way. But we find in chapter 1 that Paul says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That word accept is an incredible word. It's, if I'm pronouncing this right, proslambano. But what it means, it's a very passionate, meaningful, embracing word. Um, it means to grant one access to one's heart. So when he says, accept him whose faith is weak, he's saying, embrace him with your heart, your yeah. being. Love him. Pull him in. Not just put up with him. Love him. Embrace him. Honor him. Raise him up. Paul uses the same word in the next chapter, chapter 15, verse 17, to tell us to accept each other in the same way as Christ has accepted us. Pros lambano. He uses that same word. And again, uh, in his letter to Philemon, Paul uses the word to instruct him on how to receive Onesimus, uh, while Philemon would be, ex the way Philemon would be accepting Paul. He says, pros lambano to him. Put your arms around him, accept him, love him, treat him because he is a brother. Treat him with no distinction there. So that's an important word, accept. So it says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. All right, what does he mean by disputable matters? matters? What, what are those? Somebody tell me, what are disputable matters? Like matters of opinion. There you go, really, you kind of nailed it. I was kind of hoping there would be about four or five choices. <laughs> the very first person got it really right. It's really a matters of opinion. It, these are not matters of sin. These aren't matters of, of right and wrong. It's, these aren't, aren't matters of salvation issues. These are matters of opinion. And you know what that means? Everybody can be right because it's not established as a fact. Yeah. We've got to have the wisdom to discern what is matter of opinion and what is something that we have, need to hold to that the Bible calls us firmly to. Webster's defines um, the phrase as not established as fact and so open to question or debate. Matters of opinion, they're not established as a fact and we need to treat them that way. These matters of opinion are not things that, that are crucial for us to make decisions on and all be unified in. We do have the right to have different opinions about things that aren't firm, called for, salvation issue kind of matters. And uh, we need to allow everybody to have different opinions about certain things and not press our opinion on them. When we press our opinions on others as almost like doctrine, we're not showing the kind of compassion and empathy and love and then pros lambano. We're not showing that. And that's what God and Paul are calling us to do. Bear with other people when, even if you are certain your opinion is right, right. you know? <laughs> now, if you know enough about your brother and sister and know that that's a matter that they're not settled on, just keep it to yourself. Right. Keep it to yourself. That's what Paul says for us to do. 
All right, I want to ask you these, these, these uh, disputable matters. I want to ask for uh, examples because, for example, for really, if we want to say it, we really don't have issues about meat sacrificed in idols today. That's not really a tough one for us. Um, you know, clean or unclean meats, that's not really a big, big deal for us. Sacred days, maybe there are a few little things about sacred days, but what are we talking about? Disputable matters. What, what's, what's an example? Women's role in the church. Okay, an awesome one. That's a big one. Women's role in the church. Drinking alcohol. Absolutely, drinking alcohol. We're going to be passing things out in a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody had there? Yeah. Instrumental music. Instrumental music. I got it on the list. That's one. You see how these aren't really settled salvation issues? Yes. Not only instrumental music, I was going to say just types of music. Okay. Like. Types of music. Opinion. Definitely opinion. Yeah. Whether or not it's okay to get a tattoo. Okay. <laughs> that, that one, I, that's not on my list, but that could work. There are some that get real worked up about that. That's true. Dan. I've heard of churches having disagreements on uh, the color of the carpet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Definitely not a salvation issue, is it? Yeah. Julie. fellowship halls, if they should be part of the church or separate from the church. Okay. All right. Good, good. Bathing suits, mixed bathing, bathing suits, all of that. You're right. That's one. Yeah, Toby. Okay, being in the military and fighting wars and killing people. That's a big, that's, a, that's not on my list. That's a great example. And what we're really talking about is people who have very firm opinions about that is right. And if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. This is, these are all great examples. I'm going to throw out a couple more. Okay, you know, going to R-rated movies. Okay. Interesting. Now, how about this? Praying before a meal. Okay. Yeah. Show me the verse that says, before every meal, you better do that. You know, just think about this. I'm talking about situations where people might notice I'm invited to another disciple's house, and we started eating, and the leader didn't pray. You know? Yeah, wow, I'm not coming back there. No, no, no. See, that's, that's not, okay, the food's pretty good. Maybe I'll come back one more time. No. All right, how about this one? Now, this, this is one I heard maybe three weeks ago here. I'm not going to give names. Uh, I, someone leaned over to me after someone had given a public prayer and said, this person didn't say in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, I was not giving names. And okay, yeah. All right, so, and my comment back was, and your point is, you know, because really, if you think about that, this is an example that we see sometimes in the scripture, but this is not something we're called to do or we are wrong. What, what I think happens is we begin to think, I thought that person was more spiritual than that. That's what goes on in our head. And that is not what this is about. This is what Paul's trying to help us understand. Don't be judgmental about things that are matters of opinion and aren't called for for us to, to abide by. I want to give one example uh, that, that might kind of play out the right way and the wrong way. Let's, let's use the, the one that Lowell suggested, drinking. And I think for the sake of not arguing about it, I, obviously the scriptures say that drunkenness is wrong, but it's not clear that drinking is wrong. Drunkenness is wrong. So I'm going to give this kind of hypothetical here. The wrong way, let's call the guy Charlie, okay? Charlie, he's, he's got a clear conscience about drinking. He shares his absolute conviction about why this is so okay with somebody who isn't certain about this. It causes that person to kind of waver, and this person doesn't jump all the way over, but Charlie convinces him, come on, man, this is not a big deal. Take a drink. And so the person does. But this person didn't have a clear conscience about that. If you really think about that, both people sinned. Both people sinned there. And even if Charlie meant well by it, and he was so certain it was okay, that's not the way that this needs to happen. The right way is, Charlie's got a clear conscience. He keeps his mouth shut about it. He doesn't, he doesn't drink in front of this person because he knows the weakness they have and they're not settled about that issue. Both of them are good. 
That's the way God wants us to be in that kind of relationship. But we've got to be sensitive to what another person's understanding is, what their culture is. We don't have to feel a need to always convince them that what I'm thinking is right in matters of opinion. And that's something that can go really deep within some of us. And I, sometimes we don't even realize we're doing that. We're telling people what we think, but we can be causing people to stumble by what we're sharing. We need to be smart about that. Verse, verse 12 of, of, of chapter 14 says, each of us will give an account of himself to God. All right, each of us will give an account about ourselves to God. You know, when, when, when judgment day comes, it's gonna be about me. It's not going to be about Charlie. You know what Charlie, Lord, do you know what Charlie did? You know, it's not going to be about that. It's just going to be about me. Now, am I saying only focus on yourself? No. But when it comes to how, what I believe, what I, what I think, if I'm asked, I want to share. If there's something that's moving, it's good to share. But know what our weaknesses are from other people. You may even have a, somebody who has an alcoholic in their family. And so they've really stayed away from alcohol because of that understanding and that experience. Out of the best of intentions. And then you come along and say, there's no problem with this. Go ahead. You see, th we've got to be thinking more than just what we think about ourselves and what we've experienced. And that's really the, the big point of this. So a good rule of thumb that we can follow for this as an example is, if you can enjoy it in the Lord and give Him thanks for it, okay, I think it might be a good thing. But if you can't receive it as a gift from God's hand and thank Him, maybe it's not the right thing. And so you've got to play that in your mind, play that formula through your head and decide, should I do this? Should I share this? Do I know about this person? It's interesting to see what Jesus even felt about these issues. In John 5, 30, he says, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I, as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And again he says in verse 45, but do not think that I accuse you before the Father, your accuser is Moses. You see these verses kind of imply that even Jesus was reluctant to judge or to accuse. He was reluctant to do that. And we need to be reluctant to judge and to accuse. Why is it, though, that we feel a need to press our opinions on other people? I need some hands. Why do, why do we sometimes go that way? Yes, Drew? We feel better about ourselves. Yeah. Comparatively, we think we're feeling better about ourselves, don't we? Yeah. Any other thoughts? Pride. Pride. I think it's interesting. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dina. I think sometimes it's just obliviousness. I think we've done things a certain way for so long that that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And we don't consider that it might be okay a different way. Right. And sometimes we can be real certain about certain things that we don't have a particular problem with but the person we're talking to might have a problem with this issue that could cause it to be a problem for them with what you're sharing. And we just have to be sensitive about those kind of things. Romans 12 verse 16 says, live in harmony with one another. That's pretty simple. Just live in harmony. Yeah. And that means we've got to understand each other. Hebrews, 4, uh, Hebrews 12 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Ephesians 4 Two and three says, these are all saying the same thing. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's our obligation to do this. We've got to work at this to be unified. We don't just have to be in the same room. We've got to be heart unified and understand each other. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how I can sum this up better than just to say, um, we were designed spiritually to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Amen. Spiritually, we took on that nature to give each other the benefit of the doubt, to be empathetic with one another, and to consider others' weaknesses when we are around them, because we've got them too. None of us are exempt from weaknesses. Uh, so we can't be proud about that. We are, we are called to stand in the gap for each other on matters of opinion. And if I could sum this whole thing up with a bottom line, when we are around our fellow believers, who may be younger in the Lord, they may be less certain about certain things, about disputable matters, or they may even be, have former backgrounds with, uh, with conscious, uh, consciences that tend to be more legalistic or maybe more, uh, more pur puritanical. That may be the background that some of our, our, our fellow believers might have come from. This is the final application. We have an application here. The final statement is, 
when you are in that kind of a situation, we must suppress our corrective natures and show courteous and affection, affectionate forbearance with each other. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on. Oh, Lord. Okay, great. Sure. Testing, testing. Oh, it's recording. So. Okay, so I uh, appreciate Jim. That was a great, great class. Covered so much. Uh, let me see if I can get my Bible open to Romans 15. Now, Jim had everybody stand up and did their ages and all this. And, uh, you know, Jim was over 40 years. You don't know how long. But uh, if you don't know this, <clears throat> uh, Jim is so old that God signed his yearbook. Um, <laughs> it's true. Jim is so old his Social Security number is one. You know I love you. You've heard him before. But he said he was older. He's so old that his birth certificate expired. Jim is so old he watches the History Channel to see if he's on it. Anyway, enough of that. I love Jim, but you set yourself up. You did. That was, that was this, this is such a significant, practical class that applies to us. I, I thought, Jim, you brought it home, the subjects, the topics. And Romans 15 just adds, kind of concludes these ideas. That's why it's a thought that just continues. Remember, these chapter and verse, verses were added uh, right after the Reformation. So they're not, it, the thoughts just flow together. We just break them up and it's helpful. So you don't just say, open to Romans, somewhere in the middle. Uh, Romans 15, verse 1. It says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. We'll read the rest a little bit later. You know, the Bible says here that those who are strong, whose consciences are, maybe as Jim said, more understanding, more informed. One of, one of the reasons that we uh, condemn, we look down on others, we throw our opinions around too strongly, is because we don't know our Bibles very well. I believe that's maybe number one. Family feud, number one. Yes, I don't know. I took a poll of one myself, is we don't know our Bibles. Well, surely it teaches that you have to pray in Jesus' name. Didn't Jesus pray? And in Jesus' name, I pray. of course, he didn't. Uh, but but, but what does the idea, is there a thought there, is there a concept when you pray, you're praying through Jesus? Yes. We're not, but, but as disciples, we're always doing that. Do we have to say in Jesus' name? No. Do I always say it? Yes. Okay. I have a weak conscience. Uh, would it bother me if someone, you know, uh, name, whose names were BB, uh, letters were BB, we know. No, it doesn't bother me at all, but maybe it does you, and that's okay. And since it came out, maybe you need to talk about it a little bit. That's all right, but it would, there needs to be understanding and not condemnation. But some of it is we've got to know the Word of God. We add things. And what he says here is those who are strong, I think strong in their faith, strong in their convictions, understanding and have a, a mature attitude of what is an opinion and what is uh, a salvation issue. And then what, what is just a thought that it, maybe you discuss it, maybe you don't. Well, he says, what, those who are strong should, should bear up forbearance, should bear the burdens, endure the burdens, should take it on themselves. Uh, like if you're strong, like, like uh, Johnny Rambo. Um, or like, you have the next one, there you go. Uh, Ronda, Ronda Rousey, is that? Rousey, sorry. I mean, she's strong. Obviously, it's not strong physically, strong in your faith in the understanding of the Word of God. We, as Paul said, we should, should just endure it. 
bear it. We don't have to change everybody's mind. The idea would be you absorb it. Oh man, how am I gonna put up with people? Well, Jim made a great point. I have the exact same words down uh, for, for accept. It means to open up your heart, not just go, I'll put up with you and your stupid ideas. Sometimes that's what we think. Or I, I'm always fellowship on this side because I know you're over. No, that, that doesn't create harmony. Those who are strong should just go, I'll just absorb this, I'll endure it. One th we had a, uh, in, when I was in Massachusetts, we had a big Christmas party, invited 40 or 50 people that we knew, neighbors, friends, a lot of disciples. We had redone our house and opened up some walls. It was a 70s house. We broke down all the walls, had this big open area. And we were excited and, and we had a few bottles of wine and we were gonna have a glass of wine and food and refreshments. Uh, but I, but I, asked, uh, I asked some brother who I knew had an alcoholic background. I said, hey, does it, does it bother you? He'd been a Christian for a while. He said, actually, yeah, it does. I said, okay, no problem. We won't drink it, we'll put it away. And we put it away. And what he says here, he says, it's, and I love this words, he says, each of you should, should not, you shouldn't do it to please yourself, but you should do it for the good of them, others, to build them up. Right. So the idea wasn't to go, oh, okay, all right, we're going to have to put the wine down, this brother here who has an alcoholic, you know what I mean? And, no, it's not, it's not for, to make us feel good about ourselves. Look what I'm putting up with. And we suddenly become a saint. And oh, My goodness, the things I endure, well, that... That, that's not very mature. No, no, you just go, no, no problem. We didn't make the brother feel bad. Uh, the op, uh, this, this past weekend when we were in Huntsville, we had a glass of wine, and the, the, the couple, that very mature couple that was there, he's a recovering alcoholic. It's been many, many years. I go, hey, are you okay with this? Me and Bob asked him. And he goes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't bother me. Okay. But we, at, you know what I mean? We're asking it on this issue. But the idea would be, as an example, we're not trying to do this to make us feel good about ourselves. In fact, he goes on, he says in verse 4, for, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. It wasn't, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God and giving praise to God and honor to God. It's about building up your brothers and sisters. It's about harmony. Paul's like, I'll just give up meat if it bothers you. I'll, I'll give up anything. That was his heart. That, that just blows my mind. He said, I am not going to cause someone else to stumble. Wow. I'm willing to give it up and let it go. You know, uh, one of the areas I thought about is certain kinds of music. Um, you know, some people, uh, if, uh, if, if you play rock music, they're like, whoa, you know, mainly I just like Christian music, and, then, and it bothers them. Uh, but, but I thought about this. I thought there were two of them. I thought about uh, movies. Like, uh, if there's a lot of cursing in a movie, my wife does not want to watch it. If, they're, if it's overboard and they're saying, GD this, GD, I, I, I don't want to watch it. But some, do, honestly, doesn't bother my conscience. It doesn't make me struggle. Uh, but yet, I, I, that, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I believe that's a disputable matter. I, I don't curse, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but some of you go, whoa, whoa, I don't watch anything with any cursing in, you know, okay. And, and my wife doesn't really like hardly any. And I go, amen, we're not going to even get close to it. I'm not going to try to ask her or persuade her. I just go, nope, not watching it. Um, I'll wait till she falls asleep and watch the end of this movie. <laughs> um, but but then, then music. Well, some people go, well, you know, uh, you know, if it's rock music, I mainly listen to Christian or, or decent music. But then sometimes we condemn people because there happens to be a curse word in a song. Well, we sing along with it. Well, they skip it. I don't know. It, it becomes disputable. It's an opinion. It really is. And some of you go, oh, I'm struggling. Yes. Some of these areas make us struggle. I think it, it doesn't, and Jim brought up a great point. You don't go and, and lay it on somebody. You absorb it. But you also talk to other mature brothers and sisters and go, I'm working through this. Uh, this person lis listens to uh, uh, cursing, rap, cop killer music. What do I say? Is that the best? But then I watch movies where there's some cursing. Are you with me? Yeah. How do I, what's, what's the answer? Well, it, the answer is not to condemn somebody. Right. Not to think, I am right. I'm going to pour this out. You listen to rap music. Yes, I listen to watch some movies. So we've got to be careful. We have these things. We have these standards and different ideas. Uh, Halloween. Been in place where, you know, how could that be harmful? Uh, you know, Halloween, well, maybe this could be harmful. You know, uh, uh, Michael, good old, that's Mike Myers. 
J Jason's from Friday the 13th, you know. Um, hope, uh, I actually knew a guy, there's a guy named Mike Myers, but, um, but the point is that I, I've met people that go, listen, we do not celebrate Halloween. And I go, okay, that, that's great. But I didn't, I didn't go, well, I'm not taking my kids out. I just did not talk to them, that's fine. And, and we had a party with some other disciples. We, always, we had an annual Halloween party and we'd go out with all the kids, we'd have a big thing. It was a lot of fun, it didn't bother me at all. But this person, it really bothered their conscience. I didn't talk about it, I didn't bring it up, I didn't say anything, okay? We're not condemning, I didn't look down, you know, as a mature disciple. Now, I, I could pull out a bunch of examples as a younger, <laughs> immature disciple, where I had my double standard and I did things and made judgments and I believe hurt people, hurt people. Um, so what, am I gonna sit down and try to persuade them? No, I, he uses this great phrase, says, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. I, Jesus just took it. Were those insults for Jesus when he went to the cross and people came by and laughed at him and made fun of him? Was that for Jesus? Was that because of Jesus? Could he have not done anything? Yeah, just, no, there's nothing I can do. I just got to sit here. I can't take it. No, those, you understand those insults were for us, right? Everything he did on the cross was for us. In the same way with these opinion matters, you go, well, we're going way to the edge. Well, okay, there is discussion doesn't mean you never say anything, but for some of us, we're judgmental, and we're on our box, and then there's areas where we're just, we're just out there on the other side. Spouting off our great knowledge and our ideas and our judgments are usually uh, not, not for our neighbors, they're for us, as someone said, feel better about ourselves. We believe we're right, and they're, they're in sin, but we don't understand the Bible, and we don't have maturity about it. That's what he's saying. The strong should just say, okay, I got this. We should give up. The strong should give up their liberty, or at least not push their ideas and freedom, because strength can yield better to the weak. Yield. That's right. It's yielding. And Jim made a great point about that word, accept. Part of it is, it means to take someone by the hand, take them with you at all those different definitions. And the other one, like Jim said so beautifully, is you open up your heart to somebody else. Yeah. You don't go, hmm, I don't, we're on different sides of the camp. No, that is not God's plan for his church. Uh, there's Easter, there's Christmas, alcohol, mixed swimming. You know, do I have to wear a t-shirt? We go to the beach, there's 3,000 people there, uh, half naked, and we're all going to the beach, but we're gonna wear t-shirts. I don't know, it's, it's, we discuss it, we talk about it. Uh, what about violence in movies? Some of you just go, I will not watch it. If it's over the top, I'm not gonna watch it. You know, I, it, it doesn't, I haven't killed anybody yet. Uh, I enjoy a war movie. I enjoy some. Some of it's just flat out gratuitous. I go, ah, this is a waste. But some of it, I go, I, I, it's entertaining to me. My wife would be like, what? What's the point? And, and we can have fights about it. But uh, the point here he's saying is we shouldn't go around condemning each other. We laugh about it. They're not salvation issues. Now, if you're going to go, I, I, I just realized I don't think I need to be baptized into Christ. It's not necessary. We're going to have some discussions. Right. Doesn't mean you're going to be condemned, but we're going, to, we're going to wrestle with this. We're going to talk about this. I don't think, I understand repentance, but you can repent later after you're saved. No, no, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about repentance. Hey, I'm, I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. I'm sleeping with my girlfriend. Now, the Bible is very clear about sexual morality. It's not a judgment, but there are things that are clear, that are right, that are core values. Jim brought up a great point. Getting drunk versus drinking alcohol. Well, yeah, but you're getting close to the line. Well, well maybe, maybe not, you know. Uh, maybe we're getting close to the line in other areas that we're not aware of. We've got to be careful. What about a marriage between a, 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 a man and a man? No, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. That's a core truth of what the Bible teaches, of what is sin and what is not. Again, even those things are not meant to be, hey, open your Bible, let's have a I think Jim brought up a great point about the judgment and causing others to struggle. We're trying to win people over to God's word. Okay, even in these core va uh, values, even in these salvation issues. There was an issue even here, someone to talk about, just, just one person about, well, what about house churches? Maybe, maybe 
uh, the right way because the Bible talks about house churches. They met in house churches. They also met publicly. They also met outside. They met in larger gatherings. Uh, so we should all meet in house churches. That's the right way. Well, amen. That, but, but that can go from, let's talk about that, and maybe we can try it, or we can discuss about it in the future. But if you decide, no, I'm going to do that, I've decided to do that. Well, it was an opinion matter. Now it goes into being a divisive matter. So we have to, these, these require maturity, judgment. Paul says the strong. Um, he says the Old Testament scriptures were written there for our example, to teach us to endure, to be patient. In other words, these are the kind of things we've got to go, I just need to be patient. The Bible, you read throughout the Old Testament, there were disputes about opinion matters, but it was never right. When you read about the Gospels, and the Pharisees washing up to their elbows some tradition. Was that a good thing? Did Jesus go, I applaud you? Jesus didn't do it. He purposely didn't do it. All those things written in the past are to teach us just endure, be patient, work with one another. There are key important values from the beginning to the end of God's word, right? right. We need to learn from them. They're there to teach us. I want to show this. That there's a verse here before we look at this. It says, it's a beautiful verse. The God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like kind of a flowery, but the idea would be on all these issues, we're just trying to get oneness through jagged, opinionated we got some opinionated people in this church. I love that. That's why there's a lot of strong-headed. Some of us are a little more easygoing, praise God, because we're all. But that's good. We've had in some of our leadership meetings, and we don't want to do this all the time, we've had like, I don't know what it was. It was tense. Uh, and then we go, okay, let's go eat dinner together. Amen. And, whew, we just had a tense thought. But, but that, we have opinions on all these things. But... We're working on our jagged, weird ideas and thoughts and backgrounds. And Jim said even our cultural backgrounds, our race, age, fire, whatever, maybe working together to come together as one mind in Christ. Doesn't mean we're robots. God, we're so different. It ain't funny. It just means can we, can we begin to get united? Then it says with one voice, it gives this idea of just one voice together, that the world will see that God will be praised through Christ because we have one voice. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on. 
CBS News. You know, I, I see that as what he's talking about. And so we work together, then there's this incredible, this one voice, it's beautiful. The harmony was spectacular. 60 people in that Chick-fil-A on a Sunday? I don't think it really happened. <laughs> Did it say Sunday? <laughs> They're all skipping church. No, but that's what, God, that's what he's talking about in these passages. Uh, and, and chapter 14 and into chapter 15. Some last thoughts. How many of us are against racism? Raise your hand. Raise your I mean it, if you're against it. Okay, put it down. And this, this is a, I don't want to single anybody out, so don't look around. How many of us are against abortion? Just feel like it's wrong. Okay. All right, raise your hand if you're in agreement with this statement. And I, I just want you to be honest. This, this could be controversial and it could be, I could wreck the entire class. If, I'm, a, I'm being serious as a heart attack here. I want to close out with these thoughts. If someone is a Republican, they're a racist. Okay. If someone... If someone is a Democrat, they approve of abortion. Every Democrat approves of abortion. Okay. Uh, if you're a Republican, you support the president. Okay. <laughs> that one's tough. Not all of them. If you're a, if you're a Democrat, you support and believe in gay marriage. Every every Democrat believes and supports gay marriage. Okay, nobody agreed with that, okay. Um, if you're a Republican, you do not, all Republicans do not care about the environment. Oh, okay. If you're a Democrat, you don't really care about border security. All Democrats, they don't care about border security. Okay, guys, I want to talk a little bit about politics, which I never, ever talk about with anyone. First thing I'd like for us to do tonight, and this, this will be helpful, is we're going to go through all the passages where Jesus discusses his political views or gets involved in politics. <laughs> Let's go ahead. No, not that one. You took it out? Oh, I took out my blank page. Oh, I did, yes. See? <laughs> you have to trust me. Okay, you have to trust me. There's a purpose for everything. <laughs> We're going to read all the things where Jesus discusses them. It's because we want to be like Jesus. Oh, the, okay, we, we've done that. There's none. There's none. <laughs> Guys, there we go. Let's look at it again. All the passages. Uh, there we go. Now that we've, thank you. He's, Sean is quick and on it. So we've looked at all the passages that talk about where Jesus got involved, discussed political views, and got involved in politics. There are none. There are none. I think one area that we are in danger of, and I've seen it uh, happen here, I've seen it in other churches, I've seen it in our movement, of dividing, hurting, condemning, is in this area nowadays. Right. Obviously, I know race has been a big part of the history of the United States and still is, but this is going past. And it includes race, it includes morality, it includes who's right, who's wrong. Uh, the fact is that uh, politics will never change the world. Right. Will never change the heart of man. Right. If you're spending more time watching your favorite news show and, or listening to your favorite radio guy, or your whatever it may be, uh, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, uh, I could list all the different people. If you're spending more time doing that than reading the Bible and praying, you need to take a serious look at your life. Amen. That's right. You need to take a serious look at are you building up the kingdom, putting these things in practice, or are you tearing it down? 
I want to look at passage in 1 Peter 2 for, for both sides. Oops, those were the fighting, politics fighting, sorry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually moving when they do, if you do it fast enough. <laughs> Sean loved that. Okay, 1 Peter 2 says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to com com commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Okay, not bound by a government, but, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Listen to this. Show pop, proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Excuse me, Peter? Does anybody know who was emperor? When, this was written approximately 60, 61 AD. Does anybody know? Nero. Nero. The very guy who put Paul to death, who put Peter to death. What did he say? He says, obey the emperor. So what does that mean? That means when a guy uh, such as Barack Obama is president, we should submit to him and honor him. Would that mean that, like Romans 14, that I agree with everything he says and all that he has believes in? Well, no, and nobody does. But it says, honor him, respect him. You tear them down, you're really disobeying the word of God. Right. Uh, you know, uh, first, I, I, you know, there are a lot of things I don't agree with his beliefs, but, but if I want to go hang out with somebody and play basketball, be Barack Obama. That's just a personal, <laughs> who he is a person. What about our president now, Donald Trump? The Bible says you need to submit yourself to the emperor. Fear God, honor the president. If you're tearing him down and talking about him and, and you're, not, you, you're constantly on that, that side, then you're disobeying the word of God. And we're not talking about an opinion matter. But where we get into opinions is where we send out all our ideas and our thoughts and our judgments. That if you're all Democrats, they don't care about border security. They're all for gay marriage. All Republicans are racist. I've heard somebody make the statement, you can't be a Democrat and be a disciple. That, if you think that, you need to go back and study in detail Romans 14 and 15. But I've also heard people allude that yeah, all, all Republicans are racist. Really? Is that, is that, oh, none, none of you raised your hand on it, so I'm assuming you don't believe these things. They all support this and support that. Guys, God's kingdom is not a place for politics. Jesus never talked about it. Jesus didn't get involved with it. He, didn't, he did not ever see politics as the way to change the world. They don't, it doesn't change people's hearts. Now, I, I'm going to say this. I probably will never talk about these things again unless they become an issue in this way. But I don't, I don't believe we're just ignorant and we don't get involved at all. You know, I think we need to be wise and, and vote our convictions and our thoughts and get informed, and that's okay. And then, as Jim said, we should keep our mouth closed in these areas and keep it to ourselves. We shouldn't be posting it out there on social media. You're dividing the kingdom of God. You don't create a harmony. You, you hurt people who go, man, I, who were super fired up when Barack Obama became president, the first African-American man. People were so excited. There was a great zeal and excitement. And, and that is a beautiful, powerful thing. Does that mean that everything that, they, that he said, I mean, no, come on. We're talking about opinions, ideas, thoughts, some that are really good, uh, some that we just flat out disagree with. We know that, okay? Guys, this is an area that can can destroy uh, the kingdom of God, can divide it, can destroy lives. And I think has hurt, hurt people. Bottom line is, to close out here in verse 7, he says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Proslambano, just like Jim said, we both had the same word, looked up the same word, kind of worked with that word, and it says, take them as a companion. Take them as a companion. Accept one another. Then it says, how does he say? He says, just as Christ accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Did Christ say to you, hey, you got to agree with everything I agree with right now. Hey, you need to be exactly what I expect you to be right now, or I'll make judgments about you. No. He accepted us 
all of us as a big old mess, you know. Yeah, our hearts change. We humble out. I want to be one with you in heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, you know, but, but what about all the beliefs? I don't even know all of them, you know. But it's that heart. It's that I'm willing to take you into my heart, into my life, and be one. I close out here. He says in verse 9, and moreover, uh, the very halfway through verse 9, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations. And him the Gentiles will, will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He quotes all these passages from the law, the prophets, uh, the Psalms, the poetry, all about the Gentiles. He's got the Jews here as he's drawing the audience in, trying to work through all kinds of arguments, help them to humble out a little bit, soften up. He's also helping the Gentiles to not be arrogant and think, hey, you'll get cut off too. Uh, in uh, Romans 11, he talks about you were, you're not the original root. He's saying, but in the end, he says, listen, even Jesus says, I'll praise you amongst the Gentiles. He says, Jesus will praise you. It's a, it's a, uh, a, a prophecy. These Jews are going, what? And all that, he says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations, and him the Gentiles will hope. He's saying to the Jews, listen, everywhere throughout the word of God, this was part of God's plan. Amen. Accept it. Guys, today, hopefully this class helps us. Hopefully it stirs us a bit. It, it makes us think, and hopefully it softens our heart to love our brothers and sisters in Christ in a deeper, more godly way. Amen. Let's have a prayer to close out. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, using Jim tonight to lay it out and allowing me to share some thoughts. Thank you for the power there. Thank you, God, that we, uh, we can be one no matter what our background, no matter what our opinions, what our views, we can still be one in Christ. We love you, Father, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yes. I said it. I said it. Oh, it was, <laughs> Great job. You too. Thank you. Awesome. Man. You guys killed it.